take your seats. What we'll do in the next approximately 19 minutes is addressing the archive as institution and as a critical reading practice against the archival grain as it was put forward in the critique of the colonial archive. We'll discuss grassroots archives and community endeavors, analog archives of film, but also of other ephemera, restoration questions, both concerning film as film material, but also video, questions of digitization, of cataloging and keywording, and most of all, access and visibility, but also the archive as cinematic and aesthetic practice, speculative archives, archives of storytelling, and of imagining otherwise. So let's discuss queering the archive and reimagination of the queer archive. Welcome, everybody. I will proceed in introducing our five guests, um, one after the other, so you don't forget, um, and invite them to give a short statement. And for those of you who, like us on this panel, are nerds, there's text, as Vaginal Davis always says, in these little brochures that are lying around with these statements um, that they send us in advance. So I'll just uh, go along the line. Also, this Andreas, I think, is out of the room at the moment. He'll come in a second, I hope. So um, I'll begin with Dagmar Bruno. Dagmar, the first to my left, is a programmer, a journalist, a film scholar, and a translator of literature. She's one of the programmers at the International Queer Film Festival in Hamburg, the Lesbische Schule Filmtage, which is now also more than a quarter of a century old. She teaches film studies and gender studies in Sweden and Germany and has just published her book Remediating, Remediating Transcultural Memory. Um, so one of the things we share is also researching migration. Um, Dagmar is also one of the initiators of the Ladyfest Hamburg and a long-standing member of the radio collective Freie Senderkombinat. After publishing an edited volume on radical subjective activist perspectives on Stuart Hall, last year. She's currently co-editing the first German language volume of Queer Film Studies. Welcome, Dagmar. You have a microphone. Thank you. I was totally inspired by Chris's presentation of the incredible UCLA project, and it also addresses issues of the context, because Preservation is really urgent. Um, the, the legal rights issues is really, really um, yeah, uh, urgent as well, or it's something that we need to deal with, especially in Germany. But the other way, the other thing is also the way we create access to the material, um, and in what way. And there are, I think, two strategies, which I can elaborate on later on. Because it's on the one hand we need to preserve LGBTQ memories, definitely. But we also need to queer national archives and to create a queer perspective on what has been considered as cultural heritage, as national heritage. So there are two strategies which are not, not actually conflicting, but they're very often overlapping. They're both politically necessary and culturally necessary in order to account for the diversity that we have in, the, in our population and in order to account for the taxpayers' money, actually, and for the taxpayers who actually finance, especially in Europe, the, all these incredible projects. And we also need to look at minor archives, at grassroots archives, and also at other formats like Video. Video is completely neglected in all the debates, or in, in many debates. Uh, the focus is on 35 millimeter film, 68 sometimes, but video is something that we totally need to address and include in national archiving. Um, and I think I'll leave it to that here now. But maybe just quickly add: Is there within the festival in Hamburg are there attempts to sort of to archive? Is there, yeah. there is an archive, yeah, but there are of course no resources whatsoever to start digitizing and anyway, and that will be a legal rights issue anyway because most of the, the rights are with the production companies or with the, with the copyright holders. So that, that's, to, that's totally beyond our realm, or the, the realm of, of all the people involved in, in the Hamburg Queer Film Festival, so we leave that to the professionals. That's a, so it's, far. A, yeah, it's a good segue to introduce um, Martin Carver um, because the question isn't all, only about films, it's also about around other ephemera. And uh, Martin Carver is the head of the film archive of the Deutsche Kinematik, Museum, Museum for Film and Television. Um, he 
has been working in all kinds of areas of cinema and filmmaking since the 1980s. Um, and in his affiliation with the Deutsche Kinematik, the German Cinematik, he has organized um, the retrospectives for the Berlin for the Berlinale from 1998 to 2003. Um, in 2003, or since 2003, he is also a professor for restoration of audiovisual and photographic cultural heritage at the University of Applied Sciences here in Berlin, and has published widely um, on, on very specific questions um, of restoration processes, and has been involved in restoring many um, um, holdings, not just individual films, but I think um, um, whole um, oeuvres. And um, the reason I said it's a good segue is because I think that's one of the, so of course we have films and questions of rights, but we also have, um, everything that surrounds, that makes up cinema at large. Um, program catalogues, um, letters, notes, um, clippings from, edited process, uh, from, from editing um, processes, and the Cinematic is one of those archives that actually holds not just the film material. So please welcome Martin Kahn. Yeah, um, is this working? Um, that's very true. It's not only about the films, it's about the other things that come with the films, of course. And as I pointed out in my statement in this booklet, uh, we do have entire collections. For instance, Rosa von Pornheim's papers are with us, and hotel numbers, notes are with us, and so forth. And but there, there are many other things um, in the archive that one could consider queer. When the question came whether I wanted to participate here, I had to rethink of I had to rethink the archive in a way because I never thought of it as a queer archive, but of course you could say we have a queer, we have queer material. And um, we don't think this is special, we just think this is normal. <laughs> you know, this is, uh, we're, the kinematic was in West Berlin, so why would you not collect this kind of material? It would be completely foolish not to. It was just like breathing. So we have it. And now we have to look at it uh, in a different way, maybe, and we have to make something of it. Of course, we are far behind these fantastic access strategies that Chris just explained. In many cases, we're not the point of access for this material, but just the archive. The access is somewhere else. For instance, we have Ulrike Ottinger's negatives, but her prints are at the Arsenal or in some other um, current distribution scheme. And that's certainly true for Rosa's film, so gives them to anybody any time with any conflicting contract. <laughs> it's because he wants the widest possible distribution. We don't really distribute them so much. Um, and it's as long as someone can provide the access to the films in a functioning ecosystem of some sort, we don't have to do that. We just want to make sure they survive. You raise a good point. So the history of cinema is uh, queer, and queer cinema is cinema. Um, and this question of distinction, uh, that we also raised. But of course, we all know that the archive and cinema tends to exclude certain stories. And our next guest, Cheryl Dany, um, has made a legendary contribution to address exactly that with the 1996 The Watermelon Woman, which was very important for me also when I first saw it, um, and it's shown in the Teddy 30 Years of the Teddy program. She's a California-based director and writer whose work investigates in particular the lives and loves of queer women of color. Um, I already mentioned The Watermelon Woman, I can't talk about it enough. Um, won the Teddy Award and the Award for Best Feature Film at Outfest at the Torino Festival in Cate. She has received many grants and prestigious awards for her work, which includes to name a few. Her fourth feature film, The Owls, in 2010, which was also presented here at the Berlinale. Her third feature film, My, Miramax, My Baby's Daddy, was a box office success and played at theaters across the US. Um, and her second feature, the acclaimed HBO film, Stranger Inside, um, garnered her an Independent Spirit Award nomination for the Best Director in 2002. I think her most recent short film, Black is Blue, from 2014, explores the transphobic experiences of trans black men. It also won several awards um, and will hopefully expand into a feature film, if I got that right. She's also an assistant professor in the Department of Cinema at the San Francisco State University. Oh, a bunch of academics here. 
Yeah? Did I get something wrong? That's amazing. No, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, also, she has, there's a show um, on, on, I think, the making of the Watermelon Woman, or the history, uh, yeah, the, here the in Berlin, in, in Kalkbu yeah. Saddam. I forgot, Somos or something. Yeah, it's Somos Gallery. We have all the pictures that led up to um, our getting with Teddy, and uh, our, our wonderful photographer, Mike Light, who was in uh, Bob and the executive producer of the Watermelon Woman. He took all these pictures, so it shows this very interesting journey. And many of you, 20 years ago, read those pictures if you were around, and you can see some of those, as well as see all that work too. So um, do check it out. It's up for, for the rest of the week. So should I speak? Yeah. Yes, please do okay. speak. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah. I want to acknowledge. I want to just thank all the curators. I want to thank you know the festival and you know everybody. I think it, we forget about how much we support each other. Um, I definitely want to talk about the archive and, uh, you know, how hard it was for me even to make The Watermelon Woman when I did, looking into an archive, and I think the film really explores that. Um, when um, uh, my, Alexander Juhas, who was my partner at the time, and I were putting this together, I was trying to find the black lesbian archive, um, with the film included, and there was none. There was the black archive that showed, you know, the history of sort of blacks in cinema, um, there was the lesbian archive that did show lesbian women and, and you know, black lesbians, but there was no archive of the two materials. When we went to go find these archives at the Library of Congress and, and all these places, rights were an issue. And so that led to the collaboration with Zoe Leonard, a photographer at the time, and to make up our own archive. And I think that's one of the things that really strikes out about the Watermelon Woman is when you don't have the rights, when you are invisible, make up your own archive and, and, and the, the empowerment that was there in that process you know sort of bleeds through the film and, and, and still holds relevance today i wish i could show the funny clip within the film uh, where sarah shulman and i know many people know sarah shulman is a collaborator of mine being in the film but she plays an archivist and i, I think archivists love this she comes out and dumps a box onto the table without gloves or anything you know, talks about the queer archive of black lesbians where all white people are crossed out of the picture and just, you know, just sort of spoofs the, the process of, of how precious and important an archive is. Um, when I was at UCLA teaching as an adjunct professor, I was able to work with Mark a lot in uh, Mark Wigley, who's also uh, an archivist there, and, you know, sort of formed my classes and, and, and used the archive. And it, it's so great to hear from uh, you know how far it's come, but how we don't use it enough, and how we don't really touch that ephemera. You know how it is trying to be very inclusive. I'm at San Francisco State now, which also has a wonderful archive too. And how many rare gems are in it? To you know, when we cry for rights of invisibility, sometimes it's just kind of looking in the past. And I think we forget that there are rare documents in there if we take the time, can use to sort of build a sense of who we are, a sense of empowerment, and sort of this visual you know, display of, of who we are, and we don't feel so alone in the process. So the making of the Watermelon Woman, I want to acknowledge my team out there who put it together, um, uh, who or, you'll, you'll be able to talk to them at lunch. Um, it's in, in particular, Mark Schmalowitz, who sort of led the campaign of just taking it on to get the print, you know, cleaned up, and that sort of leads into a wonderful segue to not take up too much time and space to talk about how that, how that happened, yeah. Yeah, and she created the documentary as one of the ways of, it's sort of also creating an archive that doesn't yet exist. Yes. And I do think that's actually an important point, but I'll come back to that. Um, our next guest is Alice Royer, she's not really been mentioned. She's, um, since 2014, the Legacy Project Manager at Outfest, um, where she oversees the Outfest UCLA Legacy Project, um, which was just introduced to us. Um, she's also, she also works as a programmer at Outfest, uh, but also at the Los Angeles Film Festival. And in addition to her film festival work, she's a PhD candidate in cinema and media studies at the UCLA, where she, her research focuses on representations of electoral politics in contemporary film and television. She's one of the trained archivists on this panel, as she holds an MA in moving image and archive studies from UCLA. And um, she also serves on the Outfist Emerging Leader Council, and apparently has an amazing dog called Walter. As the internet told me, the internet told me that. <laughs> I do. Welcome, Alice. 
I have some photos of him in the past couple of weeks, if you guys are interested, uh, updates of what's going on in LA with Walter. Um, so, yes, thank you. And you also Twitter, right? And I do tweet. I Instagram. Twitter, you tweet. My, yeah. my English is deteriorating along the <laughs> festival. Um, yeah, thank you. Wow. Very detailed. Um, yeah, so I won't spend a ton of time introducing the Outfest UCLA Legacy Project since Chris uh, did a great job of sort of covering that and it's come up in a couple of other uh, comments. We uh, just were collaborating with Cheryl and the team that she was mentioning on uh, a digital restoration of the Watermelon Woman, which premiered here, very exciting. Um, and um, as Chris mentioned, we work in terms of uh, providing access online as well with the In the Life Project. Uh, but the Legacy Project, to sort of summarize, we, we work on fighting the crisis of the LGBT film preservation on three main fronts. Uh, access, which we can be providing online or in the form of programming. Um, preservation, which um, is kind of self-explanatory in this context. And also education. Um, so like Cheryl was mentioning, we've had several courses taught at UCLA, hers included, that focus exclusively, um, sometimes and sometimes not exclusively, on materials from the Legacy Project collection. Um, we also do some other educational initiatives uh, in terms of providing filmmakers with, with education on how to preserve their films or um, best practices in, in their own work, uh, keeping their own work safe and also how we can help keep their own work safe. Um, because, you know, part of the, the big issue with queer film is that it hasn't had the institutional support that other more mainstream film uh, making practices have had. Um, and so the rights, as has been mentioned several times here, become a problem because the, uh, the rights holders or the production companies sort of come together, fly by night for a single film and then um, dissipate afterwards. So it's unclear who holds the rights, which puts films in, in sort of holding patterns or they end up in someone's closet or their basement, and um, that's obviously not an ideal way to store any sort of media format. Um, so, so we try to educate filmmakers about that, and then also we're working in, uh, California has recently passed a law mandating that uh, these social and cultural and political contributions of LGBT people be taught in public schools. So we're working with the one national gay and lesbian archives in based in Los Angeles, um, to develop a curriculum uh, that can be distributed to public schools for high, middle school and high school students uh, using materials from the collection to educate uh, about LGBT history more broadly. Um, and sort of to some of the parts, that, the points that Dagmar brought up um, in terms of the ways that we can queer uh, archival practice. I, I like to think in my own role as the Legacy Project Manager, um, because we have tons and tons of people who devote themselves to this project, but I'm very, very fortunate to be the only one whose actual job it is to, to be thinking about this all the time. Um, so I like to try to think about the Legacy Project as an opportunity to queer archival practice. Um, we are a program that has Outfest on one hand, um, a, a queer organization that has, is pretty established but is always trying to, to push boundaries um, and a collaboration with UCLA Film and Television Archive which is a um, very long established institutional archive. It's the second largest archive uh, in the U.S. or the world? U.S. Okay. Uh, in, in the U.S. Um, so, so they, and they have all of the infrastructure um, and knowledge to, uh, to maintain a, a film collection. And then we have the Outfest perspective that can always be thinking about new ways to do, you know, what to do with that kind of a collection. Um, and so in terms of queering an institutional practice, um, we can come at it from several ways and, and use our unique position to collaborate with other smaller queer archives that maybe don't have access to the same sort of large infrastructures and institutional uh, benefits. Uh, and, and think about ways that we can all be reaching out to each other and, and all coming together to think about new ways to use the archive. So that's something I'm really excited about talking about today. Yeah, maybe, I, I think it's also a good reminder to talk about how Outfest, Outfest came out of UCLA, right? Um, yeah. And how that, because I think this conjunction between festival, archive, and let's say education or the university isn't coincidental. 
but just to remind us, because I don't think everyone knows. Of course, yeah. Outfest um, started at UCLA in 1982. It was started by some graduate students there who felt like they weren't seeing themselves represented on screen and wanted to make a space for that to be possible and also to discuss what that might mean and, and what those sorts of representations um, could be in the future. So it was actually an academic conference and screening series for the first couple of years and then grew to become um, the Los Angeles Gay and Lesbian Film Festival and then eventually the name became Outfest in the 90s, but we've been around since 1982. Um, and so when the Legacy Project was founded in 2005, it was um, so in response to a couple of things. Um, some from Bob Hawk, uh, who was seeing uh, some films that, or one film in particular, Word Is Out, that was um, basically deteriorating and we didn't know what to do with it and had been, was missing scenes and we didn't know what the elements were. Um, and then with Parting Glances, our first restoration, uh, we sort of noticed a deterioration there as well. Um, and um, when the, the folks at Outfest realized this, the natural thing to do was to go to UCLA because that's where we had started and they knew how to help us. So, um, and you know, bring obviously an equal partnership um, we've created eventually. Thank you. Our last guest um, is Andreas Kass. He's a professor of German literature with a focus on medieval and queer studies at the Humboldt University here in Berlin. He's, uh, where he's also uh, part of the Center for Transdisciplinary Gender Studies um, and runs, it is involved in two large research projects um, next to the one that we'll talk about in a second, including medieval hymns and their translation into German, as well as one on love, friendship, and sexuality in antiquity. Um, and he is the director of the Research Center Archive for Sexology that investigates the cultural heritage of Magnus Hirschfeld and his Institute for Sexology in, here in Berlin. Um, his list of publications is as vast as his research areas and includes no less than four monographs um, and another one is forthcoming this summer on the literary history of friendship between men. Um, and now with the Magnus Hirschfeld archive, um, to me the whole history of sexology was something that I learned about when I was a student in Berkeley in the mid-90s, the class by Gail Rubin. I had not known about this and I think that's part of a history that's kind of I mean, it has been eradicated by, the, uh, by National Socialism, by the Nazis, um, and yet there, are, there is an existing archive, um, and this archive isn't just about the history of Martin Hirschfeld, um, and this history of queer theory that has also sort of only in recent years been sort of reactivated, um, but also it extends into more recent history. So please welcome Andreas Kost to talk and present us the archive that you're involved in. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm uh, a little intimidated to be on this panel because I'm not a film expert at all, but <laughs> there might be three things that I could talk about. The first one would be the th theoretical concept um, of the archive as defined by Foucault because it may help to, um, to talk about the uh, how uh, the archive of heteronormativity and the queer archive uh, relate to each other. The second could be um, Magnus Hirschfeld and his cultural heritage, and this is also where film uh, um, is involved. And the third one uh, could be the major project that we are currently working on in our research uh, center. Thank you for having me. Yeah. But maybe you can start by. Tri uh, by um presenting what the, exactly what the Magnus Hirschfeld holdings are and what the current project involves in sort of, yeah. Okay, there is... Um, there Maybe for those who don't know who Mag Magnus Hirschfeld was. Okay, so Magnus Hirschfeld was a gay um, sexologist here in Berlin. He ran the Institute um, of Sexology during the uh, Weimar Republic um, and he's very uh, famous and very important uh, also for the gay rights movement um, and um, there is an archive at the University Library of the Humboldt University in his name. It's called the Herberle Hirschfeld uh, Archive. Herberle was a sexologist uh, here in Berlin and he 
uh, collected a lot of materials and uh, like 10 years ago he donated it to the university library and there was no one who um, was uh, actually uh, taking care of this archive and this um, was my chance to do so and I'm professor here, no, I've been a professor here now for, for three years and um, I founded this research center and we are trying to, uh, to um, do research work on this archive which contains contemporary material from um, after the Second World War but we are also trying to enlarge this archive and currently we are collecting documents from the early uh, HIV and AIDS movement in order to um, to secure the history of the 80s and the 90s and to uh, get hold of like, very personal documents but also records from societies who were involved with um, with the AIDS crisis in the 80s and the 90s. And um, among the collection are many photographs and I do think even though that takes the notion of cinema quite far it is, there, there are relations, media technological relations, as well as of course that um, to, to address the question of the history and the memory of the AIDS activism has everything to do with also the origination of queer theory as we have it now established in universities, but also of festivals, of queer festivals. And maybe my first question to you, as vast as the sort of different aspects you all brought up and, and um, I guess it, the details we could discuss of pertain, like specific questions of restoration and digitization, for instance, I would like to start with more an observation that I think when most of the queer film festivals started, they were more or less archival practices. What, how it started out, out was sort of to raid the history of cinema and appropriate and reappropriate. Um, and create and, and make visible the reading practices that have always existed to show how queer even mainstream cinema was. And that's why I sort of made, um, pointed out the watermelon woman. Now we're talking then of 1996, so already the whole idea of new queer cinema was well on its way, yet it shows how those earlier years of fest festival programming, of festival making, and of of um, where creating an archive, um, and not in the sense of the traditional archiving um, questions, these are coming up now and they come up I think for a reason. Um, and so I would like to ask all of you how, because I th about this turning moment, um, when from the times of sort of doing programming and festival or um, in your various works, um, the archive was basically the approach to what we were doing, to realizing that queering the archive or queer archive practices was also a very concrete project to be um, addressed. Who would like to start? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll maybe start with a, sm with a small idea. Um, that it, what I think is really interesting looking back at, I totally agree that it, queer film uh, festival started with the archive and how when there were fewer fil fewer queer films to choose from um, it was a necess it was a necessity for queer people to go in and, and have queer viewing practices and do uh, readings against the grain of mainstream texts um, the idea of camp right and, and um, finding yourself on screen in whatever way you could and then there was a moment when um, maybe we're still in that moment when LGBT audiences, in, at least in the US, I don't, I'm not sure about outside, um, really rejected that and were like not open to, to, to having um, a queer sensibility or, or finding a queer sensibility in other kinds of films and only wanted to see this particular kind of LGBT film on, on screen. And like at Outfest, people get, um, audiences don't like it when we show films that they view as insufficient in terms of queer content. Um, and so we're returning to the archive now of, of queer film and realizing that we've sort of neglected that, which is, which is ironic, I guess. That's pretty much the thought that I had. Um, and so, and so um, we're, we're trying to go remedy that and take care of it, and that's part of what the Legacy Project is doing. Um, and I think that there are filmmakers who are, are going and finding the same thing, like Cheryl finding a lack 
of, of, a, of a queer archive. And so we're just in the moment now where we're trying to make sure that we're taken care of in the same way that these films that, that we had to go and, and find were taken care of, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking, I mean, before I lose my thoughts, um, the, the concept of like what is archivable, I think is something that we have to think about too, um, around especially the people of color and the work that we consider archivable. And I think that's something that doesn't come up, like the value of what is in the archive or what, you know, what can be held. Um, it's interesting to see in the States, and I don't know if it's happening here, but there's like a lesbian home movie project that's happening, I think that's what it's called, where people are just sending home movies and, ha and the value of that as an example of a, a queer life that's lived versus you know, something that the academy, which you know, again is about class and who has access to you know, show that work and, and be included in that work um, and make those films, and then we, you know, I think um, Vilan did talk about um, you know, the men you know, talking about that sort of history. And then Barbara saying something in that clip in Bob's film you know, which triggered me to, to think about um, how her work wasn't playing well in lesbian bars. So you definitely have to think about like, who is consuming the archive, who is archivable, you know, and, and I, I definitely feel it's about, you know, class. I mean, you know, the folks that we're making films about and the lives that we're making films about, even myself as a person of color, you know, really, I mean, are, we're, you know, we're, we're pulling from the archive of life and, you know, putting a spotlight on it. But there's so many people, especially in the queer people of color and, and trans and folk color community, they don't have access to this. You know, they're not thinking in these terms. They don't come to our festivals as programmers. You know, how do we, how do we deal with that? And I think that's an important thing about, like, the archive is sort of unapproachable. You know, it's this thing where I have to walk through a, you know, a white institution and understand what it is. So, you know, even when I was working on the um, prison project, I had to go into a women's correctional facility to get the truth that I needed to make my script um, called, you know, For Stranger Inside. So you definitely wanna, I think that's something that we, we think about who's not archivable within this context and, and how we can, you know, make archives sexy, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, or, or make it accessible. And I, I think we, we that could help in our dealing with not only race, class, and gender differences within America, but within the world. That's all. And I think your film, The Watermelon Woman, um, actually does both things. It both is, is an act of empowerment, of uh, creating an archive which allows uh, a discursive space for, for black lesbian positions um, to, articul to be articulated in, but it also queers the process of archiving with this fake mockumentary photograph project with Zoe Leonard in it. And so it's, it's very deconstructive, very postmodern in that approach. Merge, so it's very, yeah, it's deconstructive, but it's also empowering, it's, it's also identitarian. So it's, it's very great how it na navigates between these two positions. And when it comes to archiving and festivals, um, to get back to your question, um, the Hamburg Film Festival actually has the same, it also stems from a, a student project from the autonomous, uh, from autonomous seminars during the student strike in 1988-89, and it resulted in a film project or video project they made to address uh, issues of representations of LGBT people in Hollywood films. It really played with the cliché. So it was also a kind of, it was an archival search, and it was a way of recreate and also, but not only recreate and empower um, like les gay and lesbian and trans identities, but also to queer the archives that is there and to to address the issues of exclusion, of uh, sidelining, of marginalizing uh, certain positions in the archive. And it, when it comes to creating access, I think programming at festivals and archival practice are very related because archives, archivists also program. Uh, what is accessible on the UCLA website and the, the fantastic LA Rebellion um, um, uh, project you had, for instance, in together with the UCLA, that was also it was also a way of program like a cinematic uh, a programmer programs in a film series. So in that way, you create access to films that were were hard to get by. Um, 
So the, this kind of move that, that we all share and, and what would be important because if, if we see at festival programs and the lack of diversity very much in, in, in many festivals programming um, is that, yeah, this is something that actually festivals and, and also archivists could actually learn from to take the, the, all the diverse positions that we find in grassroots archives, for instance, the Lesbian Home Movie Project in Maine, um, and so on. So all this expertise that we have there in, in these cross or in the Berlin-based Spinborden Lesbian Archive or Built Vexel in Hamburg with its with its incredible experience. So that that it's great that you address this uh, these possibilities of collaborating with archives, professional archives that have fantastic um, uh, ways of sustainable preservation because this is something that the, the small underfunded grassroots archives cannot uh, deliver. Yeah. At, the, at the end of, in 1990, Yvonne Rayner made a film called Privilege, which is about menopause and the rape lynching complex, and it ends over the credits with all the people involved in the film conglomerating, and in the, back, in, in the room you see a poster of that conference, Where do I, uh, How Do I Look? The first, uh, at least in North America, the first sort of queer cinema conference. And recently, a couple of years ago, Mark Siegel, the film scholar, rephrased that question, not how do I look, but where do I look? So that question that Cheryl just uh, raised is what goes into the archive? I would like to expand to the dis question of access that you also addressed. So you all work in very different ways with archives um, and about the question of archive, and maybe this is more to Andreas and Martin and Alice, the question of what kind of various forms of access you create. Um, so Martin, you also said yours, the, and the kinematic's work is really one of restoration and, um, and saving, um, but not of distribution. Um, but of course, um, you have different practices of how you go about um, whether you are able, because as an institution you can do that, or whether you, I'm wondering, for instance, with Andreas, how you um, sort of collect um, the more recent material of the AIDS activism in, uh, I'm assuming in this case, West Germany, but I'm not entirely sure. Maybe you can elaborate on how, what kind of do you invite other scholars to work with, aside from you know the, the amazing um, opportunity that UCLA, for instance, has with the Legacy Project of actually creating all these online databases. There are other ways of working um, with archives and, and creating access. Ooh, that's a, a huge task. <laughs> um, well, as I said, if a film is alive in an ecosystem in distribution somewhere, then we don't have to deal with it until it breaks down. Then, of course, we have to rethink what we will do with our archival elements. Can we take in the distribution prints that are no longer taken care of by someone? Will we make them available? Are they still good enough? Do we have to make new copies? Do we have to digitize whatever? You know, it is really for every um, for every work that we keep, for every film that we keep. Actually, it may be a different issue, and so it's like film specific, if you will. And the approach is, of course, that we want to make as much as we can the things accessible that we keep, unless someone else does it already. We don't want to duplicate activity because we don't have enough power to duplicate anybody's activity, obviously. Um, a good example is perhaps um, the work of Maria Lang, which I mentioned in my little statement. You know, she made some very important films where she was at the film school in Berlin, and we keep the archive of the film school since 1966, so there is new film coming in all the time, and some of it is queer. We never looked at it as queer, we looked at this, this is the film school collection, you know, because it's just one of those collections that we have, de rigueur. Now, with, a, with an interest for queer filmmaking, we look into that. Maria Lang is dead. She, she left some money behind, but she left this legacy behind, and we have to somehow, I feel the obligation that we have to keep it alive, because we have to do something about it. Then there is Ute Raurant, who, I don't know whether you term her a queer filmmaker or something, and that's for you to decide, but we have her films as well, and she's active in keeping Maria's films public. So we collaborate with her, making it possible that these films will come onto the screen again, outside of, a, of an obsolete 60mm format at some point. And 
that's a form of curating, you might say, but it's, it's more like curating in a physical sense. You know, we, we, we curate <laughs> that yeah, this film we is or is not a The old term before it became such an ubiquitous in the, in the 2000s, everyone wanted to be a DJ now. Everyone oh, yeah, was a curator. curating everything. We can remind all things. of you what it actually meant. It meant caretaking, I think. Yeah, keeping. You know, the BFI had, I don't know whether they still have it, they had a wonderful term for people who take care of the films there. It wasn't curators, but it was keepers. And I always loved that term. It's an interesting question that you raised that I think just will follow through and maybe, who knows, comes up in the second panel around the queer programming. Um, do we queer the archive in the sense that we name it in its specificity, or do we not? And what does it mean? What's a, so with the oeuvre of Maria Lan, that's also sort of experimental work. When when does it get named as queer? Is that a mis like the strategic? I already raised the question of cataloging and keywording. Yeah. They sound like something small, but it's something that t tells about the politics of how we see works and. This question is, you know, it may, it may seem simple, but it's not. Um, you know, the whole oeuvre of Ulrike Ottinger, do you squarely place it in the frame of queer cinema? Um, what about, um, or not? Um, which parts will, you know, for, in some cases it's easy, in some cases it's not easy, or the audience may refuse to see it as that, or will do so. Um, and I think it's also interesting within the institution, do you make it a special area of the museum, or is are you talking about the history of cinema as queer cinema? No, does the filmmaker even want to be termed that way in yeah, your exactly. catalogue? You know? I don't know about what, what, what Ulrike thinks about it, I never asked her. It but just like never your... came up to me because I thought these films were great. That would be my term. You know, these are great films, that's why we want to keep them. And then they have other aspects to them, and it may be many aspects. I guess the point that you raise of like treating each case in its specificity is also important because when we talk about digitization, digitization or um, restoration, we're actually also faced, it also sounds simple, but each decision of how to instance transfer a film from analog celluloid to a digitized version creates like very specific technical questions and of course once you have it digitized you still have the question of which codex and on what material do you store it and it's each case there is it's there's never one simple answer but i'd like to continue with the access question both to alice and andreas how who works on your archives who how do you expand it into the world i mean i guess with ucla it's a bit easier because it also has this online you would think yeah, um, it, it would be great if it was. Uh, I think that, um, and I think Chris probably agrees, um, that cataloging, like you said, it seems small, but it is such a huge thing. And right now we have a gigantic backlog in our cataloging because even though we have, um, you know, the, the major um, archive and a major university um, as part of the program, there's still funding issues. Um, public education in the U.S. doesn't get the same funding it used to. And um, not that it was ever as good as you guys have it over here, but um, but yeah, so, so we have a, a real funding issue. It's a very unsexy thing that grants um, and grant issuing organizations are not very interested in funding as we've learned so far. And the fact that we, that our, our holdings, 36,000 at this point and growing, um, are largely uncatalogued is, is I think the greatest roadblock to our creating access um, for the collection because we do have, I mean, we did get a grant for the In the Life collection and so that is completely cataloged. Um, although, as Chris mentioned, the Library of Congress uh, controlled vocabulary for the tagging is, is pretty problematic and that is a specific issue for, for queer bodies of work in general. Um, but, but yeah, so we, we can't, like if, if someone is looking for, um, something very specific, there's not a way to know for sure at this point whether or not it's in the collection. We have a general idea, and, and people like Mark Quigley, who Cheryl mentioned, are, are some of the ones, uh, we have archivists who know in their own experience what's in the collection, um, but they don't have every single detail, and there's no searchability right now. And so that is is sort of the greatest impediment, and, and the unsexiness of it is a real problem. And also, I, I and the, the point that you guys are bringing up about how to categorize people and their work um, is, 
an issue, and, and it, it goes back to this question of where to look, because if you want to say, I'm gonna categorize this as a great film, that leaves people who are looking for to see themselves represented still with the problem of not knowing where to go. And so it's sort of, I don't know that there is an answer to it. No, but I, one of the questions I have is, do you, for instance, to, so to, one has various ways of working with an archive, and, um, and one can be extending invitations to not only scholars, but artists or filmmakers to work with it. In your case, it seems mm, like the most immediate idea is to um, have PhD projects, for instance, students of, this, of the school to work with the, and, and basically educate themselves, but also create research projects around it. Is that happening, for instance? Yes and no. Um, we have PhD students who are interested in the collection and who are working on films that they know that are already in the collection, but to my knowledge, there have not yet been any PhD students in the archival or information studies realm who are making it a project to, to go through and actually see everything that's there. Um, so we know, like, we have a collection by um, a filmmaker and activist, Pat Rocco, who documented a lot of the early LGBT rights movement in Los Angeles especially. Um, and so that's a lot of unique footage that do doesn't exist anywhere else. And so that is something, because he's a somewhat well-known figure already, but his films have never been in one place before. People are working on that part of the collection, um, but we don't have anyone who said, um, at least that I know of, I wanna just go and see everything. Because we can't really provide that to them right now because it's, it's just, a lot of it hasn't even really been uh, assessed by the archival staff. No, that's, what, that's why I ask, because I do think that that is what, one of the forms to just create a larger community of people working with it, and not only from the specific sort of like archive studies background, but also, I mean, the question of the archive is one that is also in the past 10 years become, there's in talk of the archival turn in history, in cultural studies, in media studies, the archive is addressed around questions of media distribution, of so-called piracy, etc. The archive has all kinds of aspects, and that's why I was thinking, since you're at this, you know, at this great school, that um, that would be one of the ways of, um, of, of expanding the, the resources, basically. Um, the other question is that I'm wondering, since you're the most established, visible sort of queer cinema um, archive, um, I'm guessing that maybe you're often also being approached by small queer festivals. There's a, still a lot of grassroots work in queer programming, even though some have gone, you know, established, institutional, um, paid, etc. <laughs> Um, and if there is such a, if that actually happens a lot, and if you do advise small grassroots festivals or... Um, in what capacity? Um, just how they can, I know that that's, I know that that's an, that, that you know, I mean, Dagmar also said that, that even the Hamburg Festival has been around for a quarter of a century and is sort of well established, but still works. It's a collective that does it, etc. For them, it's also a question, how do we do this process of archiving? Um, and I am very sure that there are smaller groups um, or in all over the world. And, and if, I'm just curious if that's part of the work um, to sort of advise as the one that organiz organization or one of the structures that kind of already has a lot of experience and knowledge. Yeah, um, when people approach us, we certainly offer advice um, in the, you know, to the extent that we can. Uh, I think a, the, a lot, the most that that happens for us is in the professional organization. So when we go to the Association of Moving Image Archivists Conference, um, that's the time that we're talking with our colleagues and, and sort of seeing what other people are doing and offering um, our own expertise there and, and uh, FIAF um, as well. Uh, the Federation Internationale de, I don't know what it stands, it's in French. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, so yes, so we, I think in the professional organizations we definitely share knowledge a lot. Um, and then like um, Chris mentioned that we have a, um, an advisory council for the Legacy Project that consists of a lot of really established archivists and, and other members of the queer filmmaking community like Bob. Um, and, and there's a grant too, right? There's a little grant for people to come and get if they want to do research there. Um, that is through 
is that the, the arc does Mark have that grant? Yeah, yeah. So it's through through the access end of UCLA, but that's not specific to the legacy project. Um, but yeah, we, we encourage researchers, and and we ha and Mark Quigley um, is the the access archivist at UCLA who does a lot of outreach as well. Um, but uh, wait, I had one more point. No, it's, no, no worries. Um, nope, it's gone. But, but yes, so, oh, 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 yes. Oh, so on our advisory council, we have people who are coming from these grassroots archives and, and who have other connections to grassroots archives, and, and so we connect there. Like, um, Ruby Rich is on our advisory council, and she's connected with the Lesbian Home Movie Project. Um, and so we sort of like are all talking amongst ourselves, definitely. You want to follow up, Martin, in that Yes. With PhD projects and things like that. Of course, it's a wonderful idea, but you must not underestimate the limitations that all these archives, which look so glamorous from the outside, have. You know, there's Daniel sits there as our technical head, and then there's two or three other people, and that's it. You know, if we have three PhD candidates coming and we want to research <laughs> something or who want to help us catalog a collection or something, how can we deal with them? You know, we have to help them along, and then we don't get anything done. So, we can afford perhaps one person for at least three months in a year, and that is all the capacity there is. So, we, the limits, I think at UCLA is kind of the same situation. We have a backlog that in some sections goes back like 35 years. And we have our priorities, and so we know that some of this stuff will probably sit there for another 35 years, because it's at this point not so important to us or it's physically not endangered, or whatever other reasoning you may have about it. If this PhD candidate comes, we can get a few cans processed with the help of this person. And then we have to hop on to the next PhD candidate who will be, again, interested in something else. That's not going to bring this forward very much in the long term. Unless we find structures that are more solidly funded. I've got a best practice example about that, and it's in Sweden. There is an incredible collection based at the Karolinska Institute, which is a big hospital and medical research center at Stockholm, and they, have a, they actually host an archival collection called Face of AIDS, and that is a, a long-lasting documentary project by one documentary filmmaker um, who actually recorded or who documented the AIDS epidemic since the late 80s until now and is still going on. And um, he donated all his uh, material to the, uh, to the hospital and uh, to their library and archival, um, to their archives. And we, my department, the film studies department in Vekrö in Sweden, was approached and uh, um, now we are starting, it's, it's actually just, just starting, we are starting a collaboration of researchers and the archive, um, they do the preservation and they, they digitize, they've already digitized everything and now they're thinking about ways of putting it online and about the ethics of doing so and about the metadata and cataloging they will use. Um, but we are actually trying to broaden the horizon of what to do with the archival material um, because it, it is totally interesting both from a historical perspective, from a social, a social Arbeit perspective, from a philosophical, philosophical perspective, from a media studies perspective. So we, we will bring together a lot of great range of researchers actually to work on this and, and uh, will apply for funding. So this will go on for the next probably decade or so, but if that would be a way of trying to uh, bring these, all these different, not, yeah, to reaching out like to broader audiences and, and bring other forms of research into uh, the archives than just Film studies, maybe, for instance. But the Living Archives projects that you were involved in with the, uh, that was based at the Arsenal, that was a project which actually invited um, artists, um, curators, or, but musicians even, to engage with the archive, with the 16 millimeter copies that are in the Arsenal archive, which are mainly submissions to the Panorama and Forum sections, I think. Four, okay. And Bill Wexel, the video, the queer feminist video archive in, um, in Hamburg is actually engaged in a similar project. It's called Die Fusselige Basis des Hypes, um, where we will the fuzzy, actually... The fuzzy basis of the hype. Yeah, where we will engage with the video, incredible video material that, that is there. And so people are actually invited to do all kinds of crazy things with, with this stuff.
But I think Martin raised an important question. There's two things, two approaches. One is that really there needs to be, like within a cultural funding, generally, at least in Germany, there is very little understanding of the necessity of, let's say, film culture preservation. And of course, not every, and different archives require different things. And the, the Access to the Living Archive Project is one specific, or the Visionary Archive Project, which worked with also disappeared archives, right? Or I just had a discussion yesterday with um, uh, uh, a guy who basically runs a video archive from the siege in Sarajevo. And their way is not to say, okay, this body is anyway, that, that it's fuzzy at the fringes. There's nothing, it's not in order and not a body that needs to be restored. What we do is we go through the world and try to invite people to do something with that and to connect it to other such archives of war, of citizen, um, of, of the perspective of the citizens of, and also of particular video archives. But Alice, you wanted to add something and then I would like to uh, finally get to Andreas again to ask how the approach of, with the Martin Hirschfeld archive and its update into the AIDS activism, how you do that. Well, I was just going to second Martin's point about how um, it is, it's sort of more complicated than I think anyone would want it to be in terms of bringing in external people um, because of this and, and the general underfunding of archives um, and understaffing as such. Like, as I mentioned, I'm the only person whose job it is to think about the Legacy Project and I'm actually only employed 20 hours a week. I'm at 50% time. Um, and the project has grown such that, like, you know, I'm just, like, keeping my head above water and there are so many people who are interested in, um, joining forces with us and, and hearing from us and, and somehow getting involved and it's just, it's becoming, it's difficult. So, um, and, and like I would love to have people helping, um, but I have an intern coming and it will take away from part of my 20 hours a week to help him with the project, although I'm thrilled to have him. Um, so yeah, that's all. Well, money is, money is the issue uh, also at the Humboldt University. So we have a lot of excellent ideas and projects that we would like to do, but the thing is how do we get the money in order to be able to do these uh, things. We don't have any funding for our research center, so we have to apply um, at um, uh, various foundations. The AIDS uh, project uh, is possible because of um, the financial, financial support of the Federal Magnus Hirschfeld Foundation and it's also possible because we cooperate with the Deutsche Aidshilfe. There are two uh, activists, two colleagues uh, who did um, uh, the, the research to find the materials and then we got the money from, from, the, from the foundation and that was how we could do this. Um, another thing we did is we digitized um, the first gay magazine, Der Eigene, I guess it's the unique in English, I'm not sure. And so this would, this is not so um, difficult and not so expensive because the university library has all the, um, tech, the equipment that is necessary to digitize this um, magazine, but it's necessary to have the idea to do, to do so. And I think this is a wonderful um, uh, tool now even for, for film makers because now you have access, open access to all these old magazines, these gay magazines from the Weimar Republic and then you can see where was the last um, lesbian tea dancing e event because there is there are ads in the in the magazine, so that's um, that's also um, I think a big contrib contribution to uh, to to um, to the film um, um, scene. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, was, I was wondering though. I, my question was, how do you get the materials that come into your archive? But then I'm realizing you probably also have a problem of space, right? Yeah, space Where do we, awesome even if the much. archive exists, we all know, I mean, at some point I was also, my, my basement was an archive for something, um, um, and, and this is more often than not the case, but um, you said it was part of the library, so there's limited space, right? right? We need, we need, we need um, money and we need meters. So the first question at the space. library is, how many meters do you need? And so that's, uh, then we, we ask them, so how many can you provide for us? And uh, then we have um, an idea of how much material we can 
collect, uh, but that's the beginning. And then we have these two wonderful uh, colleagues, um, Axel Schock and Corinna Gerkele, and they know uh, who has something on the attic or in the in the cellar or wherever. And they started collecting material, and now we are negotiating with the library whether or not they are able to 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 take this. And it's all that there is a third problem. The thing is, you can only collect originals. But many of the documents are copies and the originals are lost because in the 80s there was no time and money uh, and nerve to deal with archives because you had to save people. And now we have to um, convince the library that it's necessary to accept copies because there are no originals anymore and we don't have you know, the, the time to search for originals if we, have, if we do already have copies. That's and a very interesting question, what an original is in digital times, but to, never mind, I feel like you need a Walter right. Benjamin t-shirt to approach that. <laughs> that would be very good. That. <laughs> <laughs> on the statue of art in times of technical reproduction. Gerald. Yeah, I just wanted to say one thing on the maker side because I think it's 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 something for us to wrap our brains around when we're making work um, as, as filmmakers. And, and I think you sort of picked up on the concept of legacy. Um, I think we as makers are thinking about, especially in America, like how much money I can make. You know, is this Hollywood of all, you know, and all that. And I think, you know, we need to think about the legacy side of it. And like we're making a body of work, and I think that is a struggle within the, the context of you know American cinema. Um, I mean, is it entertaining or is it in, informative? So I, I really do feel like the makers need to kind of think about what you know what we're doing. Are we one hit wonders when we know like a lot of like this is the only time we can see certain queer films or within the context of this festival and we'll never see them again. So we really do need to think about like what what we're doing as makers. And it also goes into the research I'm doing with sort of Black is Blue. And as a maker, um, I live in Oakland and I'm looking for history about Oakland life, you know, queer life in Oakland. It, 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 it was never documented, it was never recorded, it was never written about. Newspapers tend to be the way to find it. So it's like a watermelon moment light comes on to me, I have to make it up. So I think, you know, me and you know, my team, Mark, are like thinking about like, how are we wrapping our head around something that doesn't exist. So it allows us as makers to make it happen. So I think we need to wrap our, our, our head around um, how creative we can be about what has happened. I mean, Hollywood on the selling side keeps remaking the same thing, right? I mean, we're seeing remakes and remakes. I mean, nothing is moving forward. So why don't we at least add that history, our legacy in the no move forward in, in what we do by looking at the past and and remaking it, you know, or, or making it for the first time with queer of color lives or whatever lives you're, you're really talking about. So um, I think that it's it's something that, to think about as, a, as an artist. It does, you address again what I also wanted to point out, one of the various sites, we have the cinema takes, the film museums, we have universities, we have the history festivals, but we also have the history of activism and not just the politics of the archive, but also the archive of politics and of our politics um, but I think we can use the last 15 minutes to open to the floor if I, I forgot to ask if that was um, the plan, but still I think if you have questions, please ask them, right? Yeah, back there. My question is about uh, is to, to the people of archiving institutions. Digitizing and restoration is a slow process, very slow. And the movies that are waiting for digitization situations are a big, big, big number, uh, general movies, not only LGBT. And mostly when it's decided what to enter in the flow of restoration in digitization, in the, the proceed is based on or aesthetical or commercial uh, value. And question is how we can put uh, the LGBT movies in that flow, how can enter in that flow, which way, or you, we need to make a separate flow that is Especially intended for LGBT movies only, but this means acquiring new scanners, new computers, new restoration programs, new people for restoring. So, what is the way to, to, to enter in the main flow? Or I can answer this question for the Swedish example, just to start with that, and then you can. 
follow up. Um, I'm currently studying the selection process or curatorial process in the British Film Institute and in the Swedish Film Institute. It's a research project and the ways of selecting the films for digitization and creating access to, but also then how they proceed with contextualizing it, putting it up online, tagging, metadata and so on. So all these uh, questions which I find really sexy. And the, in the Swedish case, they, they really have a um, they know that time is limited and they can only choose like 100 films per year and so they have a list of priorities and they say well, within of these 100 films we digitize each year we want um, our priorities are female filmmakers that's one of the priorities another priority would be films for kids and young adults and there are some other classifications LGBT is not on that list though um, but, the, I mean, it's, it's part of like your concept as an archive. The BFI has a project called Unlocking Heritage, and they have certain, yeah, they, they always try to include a lot of, because they have this collaboration with Flair, with the LGBT film, Q Film Festival in London, so there is, they try to include as many Flair films as possible, or on the BFI iPlayer there, there is this kind of channel. But, but I think just online access can allow us to both include these the queer films or, or LGBT films into the, the national canon of what is counted, uh, uh, what, what actually goes as cultural heritage of the nation or national heritage, but it can also be an X because you can tag it so that it comes up in different sections in, in, uh, online as LGBT heritage or national heritage, for instance, genre film or whatever. So then it's a, it's a way of having this perspective which we often lack in archives and programming. There was a question in the back there, and then I'll give it to you. Hi, I'm um, uh, from Labor Berlin, an analog film collective here in uh, Berlin. Uh, and we're also, we basically are a lab, so we function as a lab. We've mainly been like hand processing up until now over the last five years, but we're campaigning really hard to like install processing machines into our lab right now. Uh, and we're trying, there's actually, uh, network of these labs worldwide who are artist-run collective labs. They're kind of like a total rupture in, I guess, like mainstream post-production facilities in a way. Um, but yeah, I just, um, in a way, wanted to let you know that we exist, but also because uh, I think there's, in a way, like many of the things that we're fighting for, uh, I think like we could open up an interesting discussion about, but also like what work is being done like with your archives in terms of also like campaigning for analog film? It's yeah, uh, to answer the question about priorities, this is a question we of course get a lot. Um, I think the, the, the raison d'etre of the Outfest UCLA Legacy Project is to make sure that in terms of the curatorial decisions that together with Outfest, we make decisions that to make sure that there is a, as you called it, a flow of LBGT images that are, are preserved and accessed. The, uh, the biggest problem, as has been mentioned several times, is financing. And just to give you an idea of how expensive this process is, the In the Life uh, project cost uh, approximately half a million dollars and we were very very fortunate that um, a num uh, several foundations, the Pride Foundation, Henry Van Amory and other uh, um, gay interested foundations supported this project. But think about it, half a million dollars is about 40 percent of what the federal German government has just uh, approved for all German film history preservation. In one year. In one year. So, in contrast, the French are spending more than 15 million euros a year, uh, and other governments too. So it is a very expensive <coughs> process. And in the United States, of course, uh, we are a state, we're supposedly state-owned, but only 15% of my budget actually comes from the state. So all the rest must be raised through donations and private funding. That's the, the issue. And to follow up on that, yeah, the Legacy Project, it, part of our big goal is to make sure there are more LGBT films 
in that flow um, at UCLA and elsewhere if we can just like raise awareness of the need for LGBT preservation. And, and Chris didn't mention, but UCLA in general, outside of the work they do on legacy, is committed to um, making sure that other marginalized groups, uh, representations of, of historically marginalized groups are in that flow as well. Um, so there are places, but it is incredibly expensive. And also to follow up on the analog thing, so happy that you guys exist. That's so great, keep existing. Um, and also UCLA um, Film and Television Archive is still as committed to analog preservation as possible um, in the financial landscape that Chris just described. Um, but we're thinking more towards um, hybrid restorations and, and what the archive might call a digital preservation um, or, or excuse me, a digital restoration. So that's actually what we did with the Watermelon Woman, um, which created an analog internegative um, so we have a preservation film element that can go in a vault, and then the exhibition element is DCP, which is actually really useful for access as much as we all love, because we're all nerds here, looking at things on 35. Um, that's really difficult for exhibition as theaters um, are getting rid of their projectors by the day, which is tragic, obviously. Um, but so, you know, we still have the ability to create a 35 millimeter print in the future if we find funding for that. And in the meantime, the film is much more accessible via DCP. Can I quickly insert this question of funding? Um, you address it, I mean, we're talking about national funding, but I think one of the problems, and it's, it's also that the idea of what to fund in terms of film preservation is so tied up to the idea that there's a national cinematography and a national cinema, which seems almost like it's the nature of cinema, but it actually is not historically. And it doesn't, I mean, we sit here in this transnational network, and a lot of cinema is transnational, generally even in the big productions. So I think, while I just think the states, right, the federal government, the governments have a responsibility to understand the, necess the necessity of, of funding um, these archival projects, it also needs to reconfigure. And that's why queering the archive isn't only about the queer archive, but also to critically address the existing archives and the violence embedded in that. And, um, and while I know this is future thinking, I hope it will happen. There is another question here. Actually, I would like to say that I'm a bit disappointed that we stuck talking about financing that much because, I mean, it is a problem for all of us every time, but uh, being here and thinking about like reimagining the queer archive, I would like to hear more about actually, there are lots of, like, some of you are already archivists and like queer archives actually questions this hierarchical position of the archivists and all these priorities and I would like to hear more about your position, priorities, and how actually do you think about queer archives? And like as Cheryl has mentioned, uh, like the class issue actually, what are these archives for? How we reuse them? How we, I mean, why now we are talking about queer archives now, like especially after the archival turn and in 2015, I mean, 16, whatever. I mean, now there is the time that we keep seeing uh, old stuff, restorations in the festivals. We see lots of archival films and actually we use like visual testimonies for activist purposes. I, I mean, we could talk a bit more about that and I would be happy to hear a couple of words, words from all of you. Well, I'll, I'll jump in on that boat because I have to, you know, speak from what is the truth, and that's where I like to speak from, and it does make problems. Um, so, you know, I guess about a year ago, I realized that nobody was going to celebrate the Watermelon Woman but me, you know, and so that's really what uh, you know, had me turn to Mark Schmalowitz, my producer who I'm working with, and Alexander Uas, and said, you know what, let's throw our own party because nobody's going to do it, you know what I'm saying? So, I think that. It get, you know, as I had to make the film, as I had to, you know, bring it around and, and bring it to life and make the watermelon moment, we have to sort of figure out how to empower ourselves in the process of capitalism and, you know, and all of these other structures that don't allow us to have, you know, we have to make our own spotlights. It was, it was so, and I'm, interestingly enough, I'm seeing that in other queer of color folks who have these sort of anniversaries coming up with their work. You know, if you don't create a spotlight, you're you're gone. You know what I'm saying? So, I think that is might might be a strategy to put you know to make your own song. And it's it's sad that we still have to you know do these things. But 
you know, it, it, it's just a, a slight beam of light, um, at least into the preservation process. But we had to raise our own money. We had to, you know, luckily I had, you know, have a film that people, you know, is about archive and people care about. But Mark Schmolowitz, love him to death, he, within, I don't know, three months, raised the money to, get to you know, make the watermelon woman, you know, new and, and clean. And I'm really proud of that man who, who did that. And, and one thing he says, too, which I think is really important, is that it's not just a, you know, a black lesbian film that we're, you know, restoring. We are restoring a great film. And I think that was something that, that he says that I, I, I'm shy to, like, you know, say that, okay, sure, but that really is what, you know, that man was able to do. So it also takes having teams that are around folks to make these identities and these films preserved and visible. And it's not necessarily going to be the team that looks like you all the time or has the same, you know, class or whatever. I mean, I think we have to move around people and see that, you know, you know I'm not a scary, you know, person. I can help in that process. So I think it's also, you know, a collective process that might involve men, it might involve another person of a different color, but I, I think you, we, we have to you know, save each other collectively. You, you did raise an important point that I was hoping I made clear that there is, we, that of course the question of the archive is one of, right now in this very moment of resistance and of activism and, and very different archives. And I spent actually the last couple of days every morning at 11 discussing various such archives. But there is also the archive that is the film archive. And, and they do merge or they come together in that, in that space called queer. Um, but I think there are conflicting interests. And yes, we get sidetracked to talk about money, but I think it's also an important issue, just not one we should get stuck on. But there's another question. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Masha. I, I'm here in Berlin, based in Berlin, and I'm involved in a uh, film festival that is taking place since uh, 2008. Um, and we've been archiving ever since, but and now we're looking into ways to make that archive accessible. Um, and yeah, while, th while he like hearing the discussions, like a lot of talked about uh, um, archives that are like. Um, yeah, connected to institutions and and already like uh, established archives. And uh, I think, especially in the in in the queer community, there's actually a lot of, a lot of archiving at people's homes. Um, that's also how some archives have started up. Like the Arsenal archive started in someone's flat, who ended up moving out of the flat because the archive grew out of proportion and things like this. So. And yeah, I don't know, I think like the money factor of course is like, like it's like such an important uh, issue because like when it comes down to making it accessible, making it um, um, lasting, um, because yeah, now, it's really, yeah, now it's really the question like, okay, how do we, how can the, the films last and be preserved and made accessible like we're running out of time somehow <laughs> to do this um, and then it's like the next question is dependencies comes with money like where do we get money from if we um, where do we apply for funding uh, and what dependencies come along with it for example when you were talking about like having to store the original or the copy or how do you store it how do you preserve it you have only digital format, blah, 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 etc. So, yeah, I don't know. Like, and I guess also another point that I've been thinking on now is um, the responsibility of uh, especially queer archives, especially queer because like, we've been so long subjects of um, research to actually get away from being the subject of research. So it's like, it's, it's, it's a responsibility to have access to self-education through the archive. So, yeah, I don't know, like the, the point of accessibility is really something uh, that I think is very important. I guess duration is an important point. Thank you. Um, because really, if you apply for funding, and I have the feeling that's the same across the board in various countries, you get funding for projects but to get institutional funding, 
if you're not already an ex existing institution, then you also struggle for, as you pointed out, right? You have only a, a certain portion, and then you, every year, you try to raise money for the work you're doing, and they're always focused on projects, on the event, on the, on the short term, but not on the long term. And that's actually a real problem, not just because of the funding, it's the way it thinks things to be of value. But um, don't shy away from talking to the existing institutions, I would like to say. You know, see yourself as an aggregator of important material that the institutions won't necessarily catch because they don't have it on their radar. If you have it and you have amassed a critical mass, come and talk to us. That's what I also say to all the filmmakers, you know, keep depositing, otherwise your stuff will be lost in your attic at the latest when you die. And sometimes even earlier for climate reasons. And it's too bad that Wieland left, but I mean, um, I talked to Wieland about depositing his films with us for like seven years and he just doesn't get around to do it. So yeah. they will not last, you know. <laughs> and of course it goes for other filmmakers as well. If we we cannot run around every day for eight hours doing acquisition. That's not what we can do. We, can, we are there. We are publicly funded. We are underfunded, but we're there. And one can put stuff safe with us under conditions that we can negotiate that may be in, to your liking. Yeah. So let's talk about it. I just wanted to add one quick thing after what Masha just said because, um, and what somebody else is saying about talking about queer archives in a different way. I think this is also a discussion of alternative economies, which I have to say year after year the Berlinale has um, had queer discussions about queer film. And year after year I have sat in the audience with, uh, you know, a huge group of people who are part of all of these different alternative economies of making queer film in Berlin, around the world, etc., who um, you know come to big festivals like the Berlinale and sit and listen to really interesting panels about this, but then also leave feeling largely still invisible. And I understand your point about how do we make ourselves more visible, let the institutions know who you are, etc. But also I think that there needs to be like we need to reorganize discussions about the way that queer film is being made because it's clear there's no money. It's clear, I mean, we, we between and Salbert that Masha has been, you know, part of a collective of for years, which is a completely DIY, hugely attended film, queer film festival here in Berlin, between the different film collectives that I am a part of, my friends are a part of here, we make films with really zero budgets, through equipment sharing, through knowledge sharing, people who don't go to school, people, and we get our work out there. And I think that these are the tactics that also need to be start that start to need to be discussed more in an archival way because this is actually the future. The like funding bodies are not our future. That's clear. I think that's that's now. Concluding the concluding remark because I just got the sign that we have to stop, but I do think it's also going to open up to the next panel around queer programming. People are still here, you can talk to them, ask more detailed questions. I would like to thank the five panelists for bearing with me and thank you the audience for engaging with us and let's keep talking.